Hollywood is in the business of buying and selling genres. That's what they're actually buying. And therefore, if you're going to be a writer who sells to them, you've got to write a genre story that they want to buy. That's their product. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, John Truby. <laughs> How you doing, John? Doing great, Alex. Good to be with you again. Yeah, man. I, I, listen, uh, we're here to talk about your new book, uh, Anatomy of Genres, How Story Forms Explains the Way the World Works. And as we were talking before we started, um, this is the most insane book I have ever seen in the screenwriting space. There is, or in the story space, period. It, it, it applies to all sorts of story, yeah. uh, which is very smart on your part, sir. Uh, but it is, it's 700 plus pages and it is a manual that I've never seen. It doesn't exist. It, this thing is as comprehensive of a book about story, story forms, genre. There, there's just nothing else in the world that's ever been written like this in my, in, in such, I mean, it's insane. And it took you, you told me six years to write this thing. Six years in the writing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, God bless you, brother. I mean, I mean, thank God you did it because God knows I, <laughs> it's a lot of, I, I wrote, I wrote 50,000 words and I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was exhausting. And I didn't know if I could do it because it was such a marathon, but you know, what, what needed to be covered, what needed to be said about these different story forms, because they're so massive and so important mm -hmm. to writers, whether it's screenwriters, novel writers, whatever is so huge that, that, that was kind of what kept me going was to know that this is going to provide help to writers that they have never had and that especially in the current worldwide story situation worldwide story world uh it is absolutely essential yeah without question so my qu my first question is you in your book the very beginning you say world you look at the world as story can you kind of dive into that a little bit what do you mean by that yeah it's 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 super important to start with that because you know, we, we always think of the world tells stories and we tend to think, well, this is, you know, it's for entertainment and that's great. And so on. But, you know, it's not a big deal. No, the world is story. The way that we understand the world is always done through story, including the way we understand ourselves, because and, and this is one of the things I talk about in the detective chapter, uh, your your image of yourself, who you are, is a story that you began telling from earliest consciousness. And it is a story that you play out every day. But so story is how we understand the world and how it's how the world is organized for us. And it's done through characters. And, you know, we are the hero. We have opponents out there, antagonists out there that we have to deal with, obstacles we have to overcome. We have goals that we want to, to succeed in our life and so on. So that's how we work through the world. And what this book does is not only talk about how story shapes our understanding of the world, but how these different types of stories give us a different world view of how the world works. So each one is its own separate model of how the world works. And the genres that you write and the genres that you like to watch and read really mirror your view of how the world works. And it's something you know, that's, that's super important in the book that I get into. Each genre expresses a life philosophy, and that's why they're so powerful. That's why they're so popular with audiences. It's not just that they're a sequence of plot beats that, that are really compressed, that tell a great story. No, each genre has its own view for how to live successfully in this world. And so... The, the the stories that you go back to, let's say you love action stories, it's because the philosophy of life that an action story tells is something that that generates that that 
that appeals to your sense of how you want to live in the world, how you try to live in the world. And it it reaffirms you, your values by which you live. And so, and so, you know, for example, you, you have people, you know, who go, who read tons of romance novels, love romantic comedies and so on. They go back to them again and again. They're not going back to those stories because they are looking to be surprised by the plot beats. They know the plot beats. They love the plot beats. They love to see it played out, but there's no surprise there. No, what's playing out, what they are really going back to again and again is to get that reaffirmation of the values and the life philosophy that romance gives us. So, so that's why revenge films are like Tanta Monte Cristo is so, you know, well, people love revenge stories because it's a form of justice. Exactly. Wrong, doing something that was you were wrong that many of us, if not most, if not all of us feel wronged at certain points and would love to get what we consider justice in our lives. So that's just a small example of what you're talking exactly. about. And, and in fact, the crime chapter is all about justice. It's all about that's the larger thematic issue that it's dealing with. And what what each of these genres do is they come up with a dramatic sequence of plot events to express that deeper thematic view. So you, you mentioned something that was very powerful. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of story, but when you said that we have been telling ourselves and living our own stories since concept since basically since we came out into the world and that story is told to us by our parents our community our religion all of that is is kind of imprinted is downloaded into us matrix style because we come in pretty much a blank hard drive if you will yeah and that's brought in and then a lot of the limiting beliefs that humanity has about themselves is stories we tell each other like oh i, I can i can never make more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. I can never get, lose that weight. These are stories that we tell ourselves, right? Right, absolutely right. And and those those stories are miniature ideologies. They are many. They're they're not just different thoughts. No, they're a pattern, a sequence of thoughts that hang together that we form very early on, and therefore changing those is very difficult because we keep going back to playing out that same script, that that same story sequence that maybe it worked when we first created that story. Right. But typically when we get older, we don't need that story. And that story is not actually justified by our life, but we are so hung up on that story that we made, what I talk about in, in the anatomy of storybook in terms of the step that I call the ghost, is that it's it's so deeply embedded from very early on that it's a very hard story for us to get beyond. And one of the one of the marks of a good story is to get you as the audience, as the reader, to see the ideology ideological story in your own mind, in your own life, and say, hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of flaws in that. You can do better than that. And 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 by showing us characters going through a similar life situation that we are doing, basically creating an avatar for us, we then are able to say, hey, maybe I can have a self-revelation of my own and say, wait a minute, I'm making that mistake too. And it's really holding me back. And I mean, and you look at, I mean, I don't know how many times you've read a story or watched a movie and afterwards you were a changed person, especially when you're younger, when you watch certain movies, um, you know, you watch The Godfather. Yeah. And I mean, it's all about family. It's it's not about the mob. It's about family. You watch right. Goodfellas in, in the same genre. Uh, you know, you might, one of my go-to Shawshank, uh, you know, th those kind of films move you and change you. The Matrix right. changed people's perception about life and their worldview and their ide ideologies. And, and it's such a powerful tool. And it's honestly a very powerful responsibility as storytellers of what we put out into the world, because it does, it does affect the world in general. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly enough, all of the films that you just mentioned, I talk about heavily in the book because they are so fundamental, not just as a story that was meaningful to us, but stories that actually formed 
that particular genre. You're talking about, you know, uh, The Godfather and Goodfellas. They're right up there in, in, in the top five uh, gangster stories ever made. And they, when we think of the ideology, the, the life philosophy that's embedded in the gangster story, uh, a lot of it is coming through those particular films. And those films, they like I said, they change society. There yeah. are films that that just change the way you look at life. And again, in, there's novels upon novels that change the way. I mean, yeah. when when Frankenstein showed up, it completely changed the world. I mean, when Christmas Carol showed up, um, it completely changed, you know, when Shakespeare showed up, it completely changed the perspective of story. And is it because when we, when we were watching or reading story or listening to a story and around a campfire, when we identify ourselves, we put ourselves in that story, be like, Hey, you know what? I, I feel like I was wrongly imprisoned in my marriage or in this partnership with this business person, a businessman that I'm with. And that's why I connect so heavily to Shawshank, let's say, or I feel wronged. And that's why I just love Count of Monte Cristo and I want revenge and I want to feel that getting, getting justice. Is that why these stories move society in so many ways? Well, there's a couple of things going on. One is the impact that they have on the individual viewer, individual reader in terms of touching something, either an experience that they've had from early on uh, or a wrong that they've experienced. But remember, it is it at that level, it's even below genre because we're talking about, we're taking the, the basic setup of any story, including our own, which is I'm the hero, but I've got these opponents who are preventing me from getting the goal in my life. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I am prevented or even wronged, this is so deeply felt because you're talking about your entire life passage. And if it's a big enough wrong, it can destroy you for your whole life. So when you see something like Count of Monte Cristo, which is probably the greatest revenge story ever done, mm -hmm. and it's so beautifully done, and it's got all fantastical elements with the Chateau Deef and all these kind of things. And, you know, it's still fantastic. So good. But he's got, and he's got these, but, but it's interesting. Uh, it, th that writer was probably the apex of plot in the history of story. So it's interesting you mentioned that particular one. This guy was the master of plot. Dumas. And, and Dumas, exactly. And, and what genres do is they are plot systems. So it's not just that it's about revenge. It's about the way he shaped this revenge story, wronged by three people, he goes to prison, this fantastical prison that he escapes from, and then he takes revenge, not on one, not on two, on three guys. And it's so beautifully plotted out. That's what, and and, and this is was really the source of why I wrote the book, was it was a deep need and pain that I saw and have seen for the last 10 years that writers have, it, especially in screenwriting, but also in novel and television writing, which is the great distinction that, that between the top 1% of writers, the top 1% of professional writers, and everybody else is the ability to plot. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. character development, super important. Dialogue, obviously very important, so on and so forth. But what distinguishes those who really succeed? And in screenwriting, we're talking about a very small percentage that do. Mm -hmm. right. So what is it? What is it? I had to put my finger on it. Well, what it is, is the ability to plot. And unfortunately, for decades, the tools that writers have had in screenwriting to be able to come up with a plot that would work at the top 1% were just they just weren't there. I mean, 3X structure, uh, save the cat, these kind of things, they're fine when you're first starting out. But if you're talking about, for example, in 3X structure, two or three major plot, plot beats in the story, that's not going to get you close to a plot that's complex enough to work at that high professional level. Just to give you an example, a successful film will have anywhere from 10 to 12 major plot beats, not two to three, 10 to 12. Yeah. 
And in fact, the last 20 years, one of the biggest tr trends in screenwriting and in the film industry in general is the densification of plot. In other words, they're demanding more plot per two hours because that's all you got, right? Unless you're James Cameron, you just got two hours, right? <laughs> so how do you get more plot? What you do is, A, you have to use genres, and two, you have to mix genres. And this is something I talk about in the opening chapter when I talk about the three unwritten rules mm -hmm. of the entertainment business today. One is it's a genre world. Hollywood is in the business of buying and selling genres. That's what they're actually buying. And therefore, if you're going to be a writer who sells to them, you've got to write a genre story that they want to buy. That's their product, right? The second rule is you have to mix two to four genres. It used to be 30 years ago, you could write a single genre story. No more. Especially since the initial, the original Star Wars came out, it's all about combining genres. And why? Because you give them, you give them two to three times the number of plot beats. That's the real reason. And so you got this super dense plot because you're bouncing back and forth for between the 15 to 20 plot beats of each of those genres. So you've got upwards of 60 plot beats that you're working on in a script, which, which in a mixed genre script. So this was what I was trying to see was, okay, if that's the world we're dealing with as writers, what is the solution? The solution is you got to write a book that lays out all the plot beats for, for the 14 major genres from which 99%, 99.9% of all stories in the world come from, either singly or more likely in a mixture of two to four. And so that's where I started laying out each chapter lays out the plot. First of all, lays out the plot beats, the unique plot beats of that particular genre, because that's your first job as a writer, you got to meet those beats. You've got to hit those beats. If you don't hit all the beats of that form, people who love that form will get really pissed off, right? You So that's your first job, but that's just job one. Then what I talk about with, with the third unwritten rule of Hollywood is that if you just hit the beats of that form, that's going to get you in the ballpark. But how do you separate yourself from everybody else writing that genre, right? Because I, I, I always tell writers, you're not competing against everybody in Hollywood writing a script. You're competing against the people writing in your genre. You got to write it better than they do. And how do you write it better than they do? You have to transcend the genre. So in, in you know, I remember growing up in the 70s and 80s where plot points and stories were simpler and yeah. if, and you go back in the 40s and 50s i mean they're super super simple yeah. uh where things that would get away you would get away with then you just couldn't get away with in the 70s and 80s and now that we are bombarded with so much story so often from so many different mediums whether it's video games or store or plays or screenplay movies or novels or you know social media stories like there's just so many different kinds of stories We've also seen, like yeah. my generation is probably the first generation because I'm the video store generation yeah. to to watch movies again and again, and the cable generation, and and there was just so much content that we grew up on that we've seen plots. Now I see my daughters who are young, and they call out plot points yep. in movies. They're yeah. like, "That's the bad guy. Oh, he's just gonna." And I I hear it, and I'm like, "My God, they're so trained already." Right, that the writer of today can't write the script of the seventies, eighties, no. or nineties, early two thousands. Even no, it has to be more complex. It has to yeah. do things. And I, I love the idea. If, and if we can go through the top ten or twenty movies of all time, every single one of them combines genre. Yes. Yeah. Every, every there's not one that's a straight. 
Absolutely. detective story. It's it's Absolutely. love story, detective story, action story, and they're all culped together. And anytime you mix genre, like a horror comedy with maybe a love story tapped in there, yeah. that's that's the thing. And, and people always ask, like, why did Avatar become the biggest movie of all time? It's such a ba- like a lot of people call it a basic plot. We've right. all seen it's like Dances with Wolves meets Fern Gully meets Pocahontas. Yeah. But not only because of the spectacle, but he threw how many genres are in that movie? <laughs> you, 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 you come over to just a perfect example because Avatar and, and, and this is what Cameron does repeatedly combine these genres, myth, action, love. You don't get three better genres for worldwide success than those three. And he knows those forms forward and backward, and he knows how to combine the forms. And this is one of the difficulties that writers have. Many writers understand that they can't write a single genre story anymore. So they say, okay, yeah, I got to mix genres. But saying it and doing it are two very different things. It's very complex because... The, the the genre beats in in one genre may cancel out the genre beats in another genre because they're telling they're telling that the overall story what makes a great story they're telling it in different ways with different beats and different sequences so mixing them is very tricky a guy like Cameron with Avatar not only was able to combine those three very popular forms in an almost perfect, seamless way. But, and this is the other part of what the book is all about. It was that, and and this is something that that almost no writers get now, which is that that top 1% is not just writing complex plots with mixed genre stories. They are expressing advanced theme through that complex plot. And that's why when I talk about in the second half of each chapter, after I've gone through the beats of that particular form, I talk about what is the theme? What is the life philosophy that this genre is expressing? And if you can tap into that and do it in a new way that we haven't seen before, then the audience is going to just go through the roof. And that's what that's what Cameron was able to do with Avatar. Um, and and I, something I talk about in the myth chapter of the book, when I talk a, a, extensively about Avatar, I talk about it as the first of the new female myth story. Female myth is a story form that has been gone for 3,000 years in Western culture. Mm-hmm. And just in the last 15 years, it's come back. And it's come back with a vengeance. I believe it's going to be one of the major forms in st- worldwide storytelling in every medium for the next few decades and beyond. Why? And and, and it's because the female myth, you know, we, 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 with things like Hero's Journey and so on, we, we hear about, you know, Joseph Campbell, we hear about this monomyth that supposedly all the all stories are this monomyth. Wrong. I have, I have a major disagreement with Joseph Campbell. And of course, I, I praise him to the root because he's one of the greats. But I believe this monomyth idea is really wrong. Um, it's based on the fact that the stories that he's talking about were all male myth stories. Because as I say, the female myth was wiped out 3,000 years ago when hunter societies, basically male myth societies, wiped out gatherer societies, which is basically agriculture societies. And so what happened was you have this the this male myth that, that Campbell is talking about is really a male warrior myth. And those beats, yes, those are the beats of a male warrior story. But those are not the only kind of myth stories that are out there. And with Avatar, what happened was you see not only the, the overall movement of that story is not only from a technological society to a nature society, more importantly, it is the movement over the over that script and over that film from a male myth story to a female myth story. And the way each handles the basic beats of myth and the basic beats of story are radically different. And he was able to see this and lock into it 
And then you had things like gravity, inside out. These are female myth stories with massive worldwide appeal. And if you break them down, you see that they're telling the story, the myth form and overall story structure in a fundamentally different way than male myths, male myth stories are told. And but they're very hard to do. They're very and I talk about exactly how you do that, how you write the female myth story in that chapter. But it is going to be huge. I'm telling I keep telling people this thing is huge. And if you want to express the theme of the female myth, which is, in my opinion, a superior theme than the male myth theme, you need to learn how to tell this story because it is going to be huge. And, and and on top of that, with other other genres he tossed in there were obviously action and sci-fi and and a few other dazzles that he did. And as, as you were talking, I was thinking back through his filmography, and you're absolutely right. Every single James Cameron movie, from, other than Piranha 2, The Spawning, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but from Terminator on, it's all – he combines those three main things, but there's always a love story. There's yep. always a love story in his movies and there's always action yep. and there's always myth. There's yep. always uh cultural, uh, you know, societal conversations like in Titanic and yep. uh in the abyss. Um, he has big themes. He yep. deals in very big themes where, you know, you've got corporate, you know, in the aliens, it was all about the corporation. In the right. abyss, it was all about the corporation and the humanity of connecting with aliens underneath the water and yep. in aliens it was you know connecting with the, the and i remember i think i watched uh i think it was his master class which if you haven't seen it's just wonderful to watch yeah. but he talked about aliens and he goes if i would have made a movie about a bunch of uh marines fighting a bunch of space roaches um it wouldn't have worked this movie is about two mothers protecting their young yeah yeah and i was like holy crap I can't believe I never saw that before, but he's he broke it down. It was pretty fascinating to see. Yeah, and, and this is this is what I try to get across to readers in the book, which is that the, the many of them will understand the importance of knowing what these plot beats are for each genre. What, but but for decades, there's been this idea that if you want to, you know, it's a famous line: if you want to send a message, send it Western Union. In other words. <laughs> You know, don't get heavy handed with the theme. And there's a certain truth to that. You don't want to be heavy handed with it. But that doesn't mean that you go to the opposite extreme and you say, well, I'm not going to get into theme at all. No, the real key to success is having that complex plot that gives the reader and the viewer this really exciting, twisty kind of story that they're not expecting, but also a deeper theme, which is expressed under the surface, through the plot beats, through the genre beats that tells a larger theme that the audience can hook into without being preached to. This is the key thing. If you can combine, and, and that's why, why I say in the book, genres are plot systems. They are also theme systems. The theme systems are the part that most people do not understand and therefore are not tapping into. And if you as the writer can tap into both of those, plot system and theme system, there's nobody's going to touch you. You are not going to be a whole different league. Right. And if you look like, I mean, and I, again, we'll bring up Shawshank probably a few more times in this conversation, but when you look at Shawshank, I mean, the spiritual undertones mm -hmm. of that film, which is not preachy in the least, they never right. mention it. They never say it. It's, but I mean, literally him coming out, sorry, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen Shawshank guys, you could fast forward for <laughs> For about a minute or two. Yeah, but when who, it comes, who, is, who in your audience is going to have not seen Shasha? I, I mean, if you haven't heard it's this, fast forward about a minute, guys. Um, but when he comes out at the end and literally is spit out of crap into a, basically a resurrection scene, yeah. and he he's resurrected, there's so many themes, so many things that that is touching upon. Yeah. That Frank Darabont did, and Stephen King, did, I'm not sure how much about Stephen or, or was Frank, right. but it was so beautifully and artistically done that that is why it connects, I think, at such a high level with so many people. And, and when I ask people about why do you like that movie, they can't put their finger on it. 
there's yeah. just something about that story that just yeah. makes you connect to it. Is that fair? I, I think it's one of, I always thought this is one of the hardest movies to try to explain to people why it was so popular. Because on the surface, it looked, it's a prison escape movie. Come it's on. It's simple. Now, it's basic. Right. You know, the guy's going to get out of prison. Okay. So, you know, it's like, but I, I made one of the biggest mistakes in my, in my life when, before T Titanic came out, I said, this isn't going to be successful. We already know what's going to happen. You know, <laughs> it's not about that. You're not the only one. I said the exact same thing. Like we all know the boat goes down. Right, like, why are right, we watching this? Right. Not only do we know it's going to happen, it's really depressing. So, but you know, that shows you what I know. But, but the point is in Shawshank, it's not going to be, a, although how you get from point A to point B, the, the plotting in that, and that's one of the reasons that I am such a huge fan of it, is that with plotting within a confine like that is much more difficult. And, and, and what he does plot wise, and then, as you just said, tying the theme, which is also expressed through his friendship, the tying that theme into that plot beat and that overall success story is brilliant. And again, I don't know either how much of it is Stephen King and how much of it was the, the, the screenwriter for Shawshank. But I do know that it is a beautiful example of what I'm talking about in terms of knowing your plot beats, but also using them to express a unique and powerful theme. Right. And also, I mean, there's a love story in there between Red and, and Andy. Right. I mean, there is a friendship love story there that is so powerful as well. And yeah. so and it basically drives the movie. The, yeah. the, that relationship just drives the movie completely. It, I mean, we should one day, John, you and I should just sit down and have a two hour <laughs> conversation about just Shawshank and let's break yeah. it down for yeah. everybody because it's just one of those movies that you just like, why is it so like you can look at the Godfather and get it and you can break it down. You look at Goodfellas, you get it. You look at Titanic, you get it. And you look at these popular films and you just go, okay, I understand. You can break it down. But Shawshank is one of those slippery stories, the way, like it's the worst pitch. It's the worst title in history of cinema. Yeah. And, uh, and it took a while, years before it actually got, it started to pick up. And pick yeah. up people started liking it so all right we'll get off of shawshank for night now guys so um so let's talk about genre specifically and i'm going to read off and this is really interesting i love i'm going to read them all off and then we can kind of talk about yeah. what you mean uh because there's a there's a genre and then what it means i guess the theme of it or what it is so horror is religion uh action is success myth is the life process memoir and coming of age is creating the self science fiction is science society culture uh it says yes uh science is a story form <laughs> uh crime uh is morality and justice comedy manners and morals western the rise and fall of civilization gangster the corruption of business and politics fantasy the art of living which is so interesting detective and, th and, and thriller the mind and the truth and love is the art of happiness so some of those i understand yeah, but like horror and religion, I know you said in it, Adam and Eve is the is the one of the first horror stories. Yeah, can you just dive in a little bit of why horror is connected to religion? I mean, I understand an exorcist and things like that, but what is it? Sure. In theme? Let me let, let, let me let me just back up for a second so your listeners have a little context for what those things that you just read off are, because I was just talking about if you want to step out from the uh, from the crowd from everybody else who is writing in your genre you have to transcend the genre now there's three major ways you do that one is you twist the beats you do them instead of the normal sequence of beats you flip that around or they or an individual beat which is normally done this way you do it that way you do it the reverse of the way it's normally done that's the first way on the plot level the second way you do it is that I mentioned that each genre expresses in underneath the surface, deep down, a life philosophy, which is a view of how to live a successful life. And the third way that you transcend the genre is that you explore the life story form, the life art form, 
that is embedded in that in that genre. By that I mean um, these 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 major activities that we do in our life are not just activities; they have a, sto- a shape of a story. They are themselves a story. So, for example, religion is a story. And we're not just talking about religious stories. We're talking about religion itself is a story form. Um, you talk about, you, you mentioned morality, morality and justice, which is the art form of the crime story. Morality is, and I break it down in the, in the book, it is its own story form. And it's expressed through story through your particular story. So when you're really getting to the deepest part of this, of each of these genres, you're not just expressing its own life philosophy. You're expressing that larger activity of life that we do that is so important, it shapes our entire life. So you you mentioned the the example of Adam and Eve as one of the, I, I talk about it as one of the first horror stories. And, and what do we have there? We have... The, the the two heroes, Adam and Eve, they're in this utopian world and they are visited by a monster in the form of a snake. And this snake gives them basically poison. And because of that, because, because they bite the apple, because they take the poison, they commit this moral crime. And who is this crime against? The crime is against the father, God the father. And because they have made these mis- made this mistake, they are sentenced to eternal hell. In other words, what they in, in this particular case, they are driven out of the garden and this utopian world into the harsh world outside. And they are now mortal. They will die. Um, Religion is basically as a story form, when you analyze it as a story form, it is basically a combination of myth and horror. Because the the sequence of beats that it goes through are myth beats. But the overall theme is horror, which is if you do the proper thing, you go to heaven. If you do the improper thing, you go to hell. And this is, and and what I talk about in that whole first chapter on horror and this deeper, these deeper themes that horror talks about is it's horror is really about how do we avoid death? It's, it is, and that's why it's the first genre I talk about because it's the most, it's the most fundamental. It's the lowest level, but also the most fundamental of all the genres. And it's, it's because as human beings, we, we're these magnificent artistic creatures who are able to create amazing castles and 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 beautiful symmetries in this in our entire world and and in our lives, and then all of a sudden that stops and it just disappears. It's gone. This this is fundamentally impossible for us as human beings to get. We cannot see this is. That, that seems so wrong. That seems so unfair. But it's a game that we will all lose. And so what do we try to do? We try, besides horror, which is a form of a way that we deal with it, religion itself is a story form that deals with it. And it says, okay, yes, you die. But if you act a certain way in life, you're going to have life after death. And if you don't act a certain way, you're going to go to hell, which is a dystopia forevermore. So this is, and and this is so it's you know it's <clears throat> punishment, it's reward and punishment, and and I go through. I, I, mean, I love the horror chapter because I go through it and and I talk about one of the stories I talk about it is a Christmas Carol, which is one of the most influ. It was, in my opinion, the most influential story about Christianity that there is. And it is, you know, very much this concept of do do you act well in this life? If you don't, you are going to pay a price, right? If you do, you will get eternal reward. Um, And so this 
the, these deeper art forms that each of these genres talks about, only the very top stories explore those, get into what that deeper thing is. And what I'm try what I try to do in the in each chapter, in the second half of each chapter, is explore how this genre ex expresses those deeper art forms. And therefore, how can you as the writer do that too? Because once you tap into that, again, you're you're dealing at a level that no other writer is dealing with. And and you know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I I if I pointed this out to you before or not, but but the way that the genres are sequenced is very important in the book. Because what I found out is I was I was always looking at what each life philosophy for each genre is, I realized that there's a ladder going on here. There's a ladder of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And that's and it goes from the lowest to the highest. The lowest is horror. Next is, is action. Yeah. And then myth. And what are the highest three? The highest three are fantasy, which is the art of living, detective and thriller, which is the art of the mind and truth, and love, which is the art of happiness. And so in reading, the, you know, I think I think most readers will most writers reading the book are going to go to the genres that they specialize in. But if you read it in that sequence, you will track a sequence of enlightenment for how to live in this world the way genres express it. John, you, you just blew my mind open, open, sir. I uh, I it's it's this is uh, this this whole book is so revolutionary in the way it approaches story it's remarkable uh, when you go back to horror horror is primal yeah. religion is primal yeah. the stories of religion had to be told to us in order for us to deal with the con with the knowledge that we we're going to die yeah. it's a especially at the primal level at the primal level this is something that needed to happen and then mm -hmm. it also might have turned into control and uh, yeah. a set of morals and like you know do this or you know the big bad you know, you know someone's going right. to get you kind of thing. Um, so you were talking about Christianity. I'd love for you if you can look at, let's say, an Eastern philosophy or Eastern religion like Buddhism, which doesn't have as much, it doesn't have a hell. It doesn't have, the hell is this. We are in hell. We are trying to escape this hell into enlightenment, which is to, to, to leave Maya, to leave this illusion and go into enlightenment everlasting. So it's a kind of a twist on the Christian story. Totally. Could you talk a little bit about that? And since we've Absolutely. talked, we're talking about enlightenment. Absolutely. Because if you, uh, again, if you, if you look at all of these art forms of life through the prism of story and story beats, it immediately breaks down so clearly and you can see, Oh, this is why this is this way. And that's that way. So for example, Christianity and Western religions um, are very much goal focused and, and it's very much goal focused to what are the things, what are the actions I need to do to get to that afterlife, to defeat mortality, right? right? Eastern religion is the opposite of that. And what is the difference in terms of the basic seven structure steps that I talk about, starting with weakness deed? Second step is desire. Well, what is Buddhism but taking that desire step and says, no, reverse it. The trick is not to desire. Because your desires will take you down the road of addiction and take you into love of false value that is not going to be good for you. Right? So it's very much anti-materialistic. It's very much anti live for the future and future meaning after you're dead. No, it's how do you live now? Now, all religions have moral stories because they're all about how do you live this life? In something like Christianity, it's about how do you live this life to get you into the future life? Eastern religion is not that. It's how do you live this life Best and of course, keep in mind that you're also talking about much more hierarchical societies that when these when these particular religion, religions evolved, and so. But the but the point is, in certain if you look at it from these basic structure steps, 
you see the, the, the fundamental ways in story terms of how these different religions express the right way to live. But they're all expressing a view of how to live well. Right. They're, they're a roadmap on how to live, basically. That's what a religion generally is. It's a set of either right. philosophies or rules. In Western, is more rules, and Eastern yes. is more philosophy-based on how to live a good life, a proper life. And But I love that you did the, you, you said in regards to the Western religions are much more focused on goals, because you're absolutely right, they are. And the Eastern philosophies and, and religions are not like Taoism, and, and yeah. they're completely differently focused. But they all have a story um on how to live life yeah. and I, I bring this up because if as as if storytellers we can start tapping into the because these are very powerful themes yeah. we're yeah. talking about extremely powerful themes yeah. um and you know if you start analyzing i mean something like the matrix the themes in there are so multi-layered yeah and go so deep in the philosoph in philosophical terms yeah that it's it's mind blowing. You can watch The Matrix a hundred times, the first one, a yeah. hundred times, and still get something new out of it because it's right. just so dense. Well, it's it's in the book. I go. I talk a lot about The Matrix, and one of the things I talk about is the concept of the chosen one, which right. is a, a major element in many myth stories. And of course, The Matrix is basically a combination of science fiction and myth. And that's, that's part of the reason that it has such power is it combines these two forms. And one of this, this element of the chosen one, and I distinguish that with something you also see in science fiction that you don't see in religion, you don't see in myth stories, which is the Nietzsche's Superman concept, the also known as the overman. And what the difference is between the chosen one versus the overman character. And Neo is basically, he's hes both. He's both. Um, in my opinion, they don't quite get to the level of requirement in philosophy, although it's a very philosophically savvy story. They don't get quite to the level of the overman. But then, but then as I point out in the book, no writer has ever been able to express in, in fictional terms what the over, what Nietzsche's overman character would would actually be because he's a character who is of a higher level morality than than humankind but isn't that isn't that buddha jesus mohammed you know confucius and the yes. list goes on and on yes if, if if it is commonly thought that these great religious characters are the closest actual human beings to get to nietzsche's view of the overman but in case of the, the matrix they were they're able to ask the questions but they don't quite go far enough in terms right. of and and they probably are doing that on purpose they they you know there there's a again there's a fear that a lot of people have of i don't want to be too too forceful in my thematics because i don't want to hit people over the head with it. i don't want to be preachy and you definitely don't want to do that but the matrix is obviously one of the great science fiction films ever made and as I say, I talk a lot about it as and, and but especially in terms of it's because it's not science fiction, it's not myth, it's the combination of the two. And that's what kicks it to this higher level. And obviously it has some kick-ass kung fu in it that doesn't hurt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for for its day as well. Which is, you know, the term of the as, as far as storytellers are going, spectacle is part sure. of spectacle is part of the storytelling process avatar is spectacle as and well so you're talking about what you're talking about there is a sub form of action which is basically the samurai movie it's the same thing in star wars it's the it's the same thing in a lot of these movies that have the big spectacle so you're talking myth action and science fiction that is an incredibly powerful combination of forms and one of the things i talk about in the book is that that's really a great technique for success is to combine genres that are not normally combined now right mixing them throwing them all together exactly but but doing in ways and there's a reason why certain ones are not combined as i mentioned earlier some of them come into conflict. They are they are fundamentally different messages, and they are fundamentally different sequences of plot beats. So there are certain ones that don't go together. 
But if you can figure out how to put ones together that are not normally connected, the fact that it's so new, the fact that it's never been seen before on the worldwide market means everybody goes, wow, that thing's incredible. Let me give you an example. Inception. Inception is a combination of science fiction and heist. It's a science fiction, also known as caper. It's a science fiction caper story. Now, nobody does that. Nobody does that. They did it by doing it in such a way that, you know, with the kind of brilliance that they can do it, um, they they had one of the great science fiction movies. Um, and this is what you try to do in terms of, you, because you, you think, well, if it's a genre world and I have to hit all these beats that everybody else is hitting, how do I get, do something that's original that stands out? Well, as I say, one way you do it is you twist the beats. Another way you do it is you mix genres that are not normally mixed together. But again, the main way to do it is to get into that thematic level, to express the life philosophy and to express that deeper art form of life. So just looking at your genres here, which is, I mean, I, I would suggest every writer take that list I read off, photocopy and put it on their yeah. on their wall because you could just start looking like, well, what if I threw or a comedy Western that's blazing saddles? Okay. Uh, and, and you start throwing things together. And the one that I just threw together as we were talking horror love story, yeah. there, that's Bride of Frankenstein essentially. Right. That would, be, that would be an example. Yeah. But there's not, that's not a very common one. It is not. It is not. It's a great idea for a combination. Yeah. Because it's just, it's, it's, you're taking the highest and the lowest on the on the on the ladder and th slamming them together where they shouldn't mix because love is at a much higher quote unquote vibration than right. horror which is at a very low primal right vibration if you will and 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 especially when you break it down into structure terms and the plot beats you see exactly why which is the it's desire hard. And and the, the 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 desire line is one of the most important things that determines that defines a genre in terms of how it works. What because is a desire line? What is it? The desire line is is the goal of the hero. Okay. What what does the hero want in this story? And so that the desire line tracks the entire plot. So all those plot beats are are landmarks on that desire line, on that goal line. There are steps, beats to to getting that goal. So. The, the, one of the reasons that horror is the lowest level is its desire line is the lowest desire you can have, which is to escape. And so it's a very reactive desire line. Love is the most active and it's the highest level in terms of, it's not just, I want to form an attraction with another person. No, it's how do I live my life in love with another human being? So that, that both of us are at the highest level of human being that we can be. So combining the escape with how do I find that person who I can be my best self with, that's why they're almost never combined. But that's, that is the challenge, but that's also the opportunity, which is if you can figure out how to do that, nobody else is doing it. And you stand out and everybody says, wow, that person is brilliant. Well, that's what exactly what happened with Jim Hart when he wrote Dracula, Bram yeah. Stoker's Dracula with for Francis Ford Coppola. That is a perfect example of a love horror story, mm. and this is pretty. I mean, as beautifully executed of that genre, of that mixture of genre that I've ever seen. I mean, because it is a true love story, pretty off. <laughs> as I, I, have, I admit to you, I have not seen it since it came out, so I don't really remember it. But it is. But I remember. I mean, they post. They, they, they literally the tagline is "Love never dies," <laughs> oh, okay. because it's this this you know gener you know multi you know generational love story between the two right. main characters, and it's just uh, you know reincarnation and, and multiple. I mean, it's just a pretty deep conversation. But again, that's one of those examples of that. Yeah. Um, now, can let, let's because a lot of people are probably listening, going, "Okay, great, multiple genres, great." Let's throw some, let's throw some movies out and let's see how we can com see what those genres are combined and and see if we can kind of give examples so people kind of understand why certain things are successes. So we've talked about Avatar and the Matrix, um, Fight Club. Let's see if you can you can you do something with Fight Club. Fight Club is really interesting, and I talk about Fight Club in the 
uh, in the detective story. And I talk about it as, because I talk about really high level detective stories are about the mind itself. They're about how does the mind solve problems? How do we, how does the mind operate at the highest level, which is truth. And this, and, and according to the detective form, the way you live a good life is you become very good at understanding where is the, where does the truth lie? And then, of course, in a social world, with all the facades that we face day every day, mm-hmm. that's very hard to do. But it's essential. It can mean our life. We, we could die if we don't make that, we don't have that understanding. And so what you get with Fight Club is it's a story about, I talk about it as one of the subgenres of, of, of transcendent detective stories, which is a story about the self, the story of the self. Literally, literally. literally. <laughs> the, the first thing that we talked about when we were talking about, you know, what is story? Story is, we live through story from the, the day we're born, because we're, we start to immediately form that sense of, I am a unique individual, I am a self, and I'm different from that person who may be an ally to me, that's mom, or as I get a little bit older, people who try to prevent me from getting my desires, those are opponents. Right. And so we form this sense of self, but that sense of self is not necessary. And it usually becomes hardened into some, some ideology, which we talked about. But at the level of Fight Club, what happens is, and, and there's other stories like this that deal with this, like Breathless, which is a mm-hmm. famous French New Wave story, which is when you get into the technological world, it's highly technological, the ability to divide the self from the image becomes magnified exponentially. And as soon as you are able to divide the image of the self from the self, then the ability to essentially destroy yourself goes way up. And what you get there in in Fight Club is you get a guy who is, he is in deep trouble, right? And so he creates, again, I don't want to give it away to anybody who's never again, seen it. Again, for, fast forward about a minute or two right now, if you haven't seen Fight Club. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but he creates this alter ego who we think is his ally, becomes his opponent, but it's actually the image of himself that he would like to be. But in doing that, in dividing himself off from himself and having it be somebody who is basically, you know, the id run rampant, mm-hmm. um, he he goes down a series, a path of destruction that can only, you know, they he, he basically pulls back from it at the end, but it is a very destructive sequence. So that's why I, I think Fight Club was very unique and very advanced in terms of what it's trying to do of focusing on the war within the self. Which is a war that we're all fighting yeah, th- throughout life. You know, it, 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 we're always get that's the voice in our head telling yeah. us not to eat the cheesecake uh, or to eat the cheesecake and then beat ourselves up afterwards later that night kind well, of thing. And, and that's why it's so fundamental to the mind itself, which is the, the and as somebody talked about throughout the book that all of this comes off the ability of the human mind to project, to create an image of not only itself, but of anything. And so so it, 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 the examples you just gave, a perfect example, uh, I am me, but I'm also somebody who would like to eat that cheesecake, but I know I can project forward. If I eat that cheesecake, I'm going to add five pounds. And do I'm really going to like the way I look with five pounds and all that extra fat? No, I'm not, but I really want it. So we're at war with ourselves every day in every decision that we make. There is some level of conflict going on. And if you don't learn to manage that, and of course, Fight Club, as many stories do, just takes it to its logical extreme, you get this massive destruction. You know, I want to go a little deeper into what we're talking about here about the self, because I think this is, and the, the ability to project, because as storytellers, 
and anybody else listening who might not be a storyteller, I think it's fascinating to understand that the reason why stories even work is because of our own ability to project into the future, to connect with the characters. That's why mm-hmm. when a dog watches, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't do so well, um, uh, unless there's you know a cat in the video or something. But generally speaking, that ability in when we're all these examples we're talking about. Let me throw an example out to you because this is such a a classic. It was one of my top ten films of all time, and arguably one of my favorite Stanley Kubrick films, The Shining. Yeah, there is so much going on in The Shining. It is such a dense, dense film, but on the on the surface, it's not. Every I think every single movie we've kind of brought out, on the surface, it doesn't seem like what's going on behind. There's multiple layers about it. There's something psychological about The Shining that just just digs into you in a way that normal horror doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't do because it's yeah, it's horrific. And yeah, there's some graphic gore in it, but it's it's not. Well, Alex, that's that's because you put your finger on one of the main transcendent horror films ever made. Right. It is a trend. It's because it transcends the form. And I talk in the book. I, 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 I break it down. I talk about why is this a transcendent horror story? And one of the things is that. You know, in the in the basic horror story, you've got this external monster who's constantly attacking, and we get the this problem of hitting the same beat, and bam, 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 and so and so the, the very low level plot. That's why genre, horror is probably the least respected of all the genres, although when it's done at a high level, Silence of the Lambs, yeah, right. Well, Silence of the Lambs is actually thriller, but thriller, and I talk about this in the book, thriller is actually a combination of detective and horror. Got it. And but but the point is with with the shining. with the shining you get instead of that external opponent he is the external opponent he's both the hero and the external opponent because he is projecting this image and what he's really fighting against the prison that he is in is of his own making and so you know he's his his sense of responsibility his drive to be successful you know his and it's so great that it's about a writer you know, <laughs> I know. we all know all, what that's like you know it, all work and no play makes jack right. a dull boy <laughs> exactly you know and he is so driven cuz he's going off to this overlook hotel to try to write this book right and and so all that's doing is putting him into this this um haunted house basically it's a haunted hotel but puts him in a haunted house and i talk in in the horror chapter that haunted house is simply the character's great fear made physical and then we force him to live in it the opponent especially in a transcendent horror story is the opponent's the hero's greatest fear turned into a character that then attacks him constantly now most horror stories don't get to that level they don't get to that metaphorical thematic level but the shining does and and one of the things that that I talk about in The Shining that that why it's so great is because they connect the hero's great flaw, his weakness, need, with the flaw of the house, with the flaw of the hotel. The hotel has a ghost, and it's the same ghost that Jack has. Only Jack's ghost at the beginning, which is that he's gotten in trouble with social services, with physically abusing his son, whereas the ghost for the house is that this guy murdered his family. But what you see there is Jack's ghost, Jack's weakness is at a much lower level than that of the house, but it plants the seeds of potential for him to commit that same crime at the very end of the story. So there's just all kinds of reasons why The Shining is this transcendent horror story, and in my opinion, one of the all-time greats. And it's, but it again, it goes to that idea that if you want to get to that level as a writer, you've got to go to the transcendent level and you've got to know how to do that. And so, and, and, and that's why basically this book was not just about how do you write a story in this form? It's how do you write a great story in this form? And I love that what you're saying is like, instead of the outside in, 
it's inside out. Yes. Fight, and that's what makes that horror movie so, so, because it is, it is a representation of what we deal with on a daily basis, which is more horrific than any monster yeah. trying to come at us. Yeah. It is the monster inside that little voice, that little thing that is being projected out to an extreme, obviously in in the story. But that's probably one of the reasons why it is so unsettling. And that's the best word I can use for that film. It is unsettling. It is horrific in a unsettling way where, you know, Friday the 13th or Nightmare Before, you know, Nightmare, Nightmare, Nightmare at Elm Street, they are just fun rides of like, ah, I got scared, jumped. Right. There's none of that in The Shining. The Shining, I always said Shining was psychological, but I couldn't. I didn't have the language to understand what was going on. I think you finally just helped me with that. And one of the major things for transcending every form, every yeah. genre, is this personal psychological element. In other words, what we're trying to do is because, because keep in mind, the hero of each of these genres is in some way a mythical character. It is right. the cowboy, the detective, and so on. They're an iconic character. So, And there's great power to that. That's why they're the genres, and that's why the genres are the all-stars of the story world. They've got the, each one is led by an iconic type. But the trick then is use the power of the type, but then individualize it with those psychological dramatic elements. That's why I talk in a book about the really top transcendent stories in every genre. Take that, that genre plot system, combine it with drama techniques, which is not actually a genre technically speaking a genre but it's, it's 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 story techniques that are very personal with a very highly detailed hero with a very personal opponent typically within the family typically they deal with moral problems and so on so you're taking those kind of techniques combining them with these genre beats and genre elements and type elements that combination is incredibly powerful and shining is just an example of that you got all the elements of horror, but it's coming in at this really super personal psychological level that you can't watch it and not think, man, especially if you're a writer, not think, hey, that could be me. It is it is pulling strings that you as a writer know what strings you're pulling, but the audience member is not aware of it. Right. And Hitchcock did that so beautifully. Uh, and that's especially in that run of six, seven, eight films that he did that were, you know, from Psycho on that were, they just connect and they are pulling on certain strings in your psyche that you walk out going, I, I, I don't know what I just went through. It's like when you watch The Shining, you're like, I, 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 I can't express to you, this is Shawshank, I can't right. express to you what I'm feeling or how I got there. So I think this is a I think this would be a really interesting exercise. Can we go through a few of the genres and can you give an example of a transcendent film in that oh, genre? Absolutely. So um, a action. Action, first of all, you got to start with Seven Samurai with the greatest action film ever made and it's transcendent and I make the argument that it's probably the best film ever made. Now obviously that that's a that's a personal opinion but I go through a lot of reasons why it is and why is it because it is a it is a action epic. It's basically combining it's taking action the act the key action elements putting it to it the epic level which in ep the definition the story definition of epic is the fate of the nation is determined by the actions of a single individual or family. And so when you and and by the way this is one of the ways that all of the genres can go to the transcendent level. You take the form and you make an epic out of it. You take it to the national level. So seven, you got to start with Seven Samurai. Um, other other um, story action stories that define the form. Die Hard is is to this day it is beat for beat. <laughs> it is it's great perfection. in action stories. It's perfection. It's perfection. Um, you look at. Um, you go all the way back to the original great action, um, great action epic, which is the Iliad. Um, mm -hmm. And you look at um, and uh, in in this in the book, I talk about about subgenres, certain subgenres of each form. And the, the because action is about keeping score. Action is about do you how do you succeed? And so in anything where you keep score that's what where action is involved so i talk about subform of sports stories 
And there you've got things like Rocky, which is a combination of sports story plus love story. And you've got what I think is probably the best, quote, st sports story um, film ever made, which is The Hustler. Um, brilliant script. Absolutely brilliant script. Oh, so good. Um, yeah. Who also did, uh, what was the, the chess thing that, um, that, that, was on, that was on Netflix a couple of years ago? Oh, um, the intim Intimidation Game. No, not uh, the intimidation game. No, um, yeah, 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 yeah. The oh God, I know what you mean. The Queen's Gambit. Queen's Gambit. Thank you, thank you. Thank Written you. by the same guy, did Queen's Gambit, which is also terrific. Um, but then you look at you look at also talk a lot in the action um, uh, form of Mad, Mad Max Fury Road. Oh yeah. I mean, this thing is just no. It's very simplistic action on the level that you talk about. Action is the cleanest desire line of any genre. And basically, it's we start here, we go to there, we get to there, we find it. There's nothing there. We go back. Straight it's literally, line, it's literally, literally the plot. <laughs> straight line run right there. But the way that he adds, he kicks those action elements up to the epic level and adds horror to it. Again, it, it's as good as it gets in that action form. Now, let's talk about myth. Yeah. Well, with myth... You've got, you know, you, again, you go back to the original. I talk about the Odyssey um, as one of the keys to the, is one of the transcendent ones. Um, Lord of the Rings, of course, is I, in the myth form. I break down Lord of the Rings as the ultimate male myth story. I also talk about Wizard of Oz as a female myth story. It's one of the first. Um, and it, she goes on a journey, but the way she handles the beats is very different than a male myth story. Um, also talk about Star Wars, A New Hope. Uh, this Now, Star Wars is a combination of about four or five genres. And the most important one is myth. Um, and, and that brace basically brought on the modern world of film. Um, everything, right. everything after Star Wars, I talk about this right in the opening chapter of the book, everything in... Uh, everything before Star Wars was was primarily a single genre movie. Everything after it was multi genre movie, and it was it was all that because Hollywood, the Hollywood execs realized, oh my God, if we mix you, these genres, we get four times the plot beats than if we have one genre, and 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 the fact that its primary genre was myth, and that combination is is key. Mixing genres, myth is the most popular genre form there is so and that's why for example uh james cameron uses always uses it but well, why why is it so popular because it transcends cultural differences so for example comedy is very tough to get a worldwide hit with right. because so many of the references are to that particular culture and even it, within a subculture whereas myth the story beats of the myth journey are are something that everyone will pass through because what myth is, as I talk about in terms of what that art form is that that myth is actually dealing with, it's the life journey, and so it's it's a it's a metaphorical expression of the life journey we will all go through, and that's something everybody around the world in any culture can understand and can be moved by. So, so in terms of you get Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Wizard of Oz. I talk about Black Panther, extremely important film um, for a number of reasons, um, and and Avatar. Th those are the big ones. Um, um, coming of Age, which is also a really interesting one. Yes. Coming of Age, I talk about it, that in the memoir chapter because they're both – what they are fiction and nonfiction versions of creating the self. And so with Coming of Age, you've got – um, things like Moonlight, uh, Cinema Paradiso, Coda recently was tremendously powerful. Um, I think you look at that movie and you think, you know, that that was basically a TV movie from the 80s. And right. Say, well, why would that be why would that be so popular and so powerful? Well, it's because the things that the TV movies of the 80s did, which was tell a dramatic story that is highly personal. That is highly moving, but done it with a twist. That's really powerful. 
You know, it's like when King's Speech came out and won the Academy Award. Well, 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 you know, that's a TV movie. What are you talking about? Well, what they're doing there is very powerful. It's, again, you're using genre with tremendous dramatic elements. And that combination is unbeatable. So you've got Coda and, and of course, you've got To, to Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Now, one of my favorite genres is sci-fi. Yeah. I can, I can, I mean, ones that I think that do it, and I'll tell me if you agree or not, Blade Runner, Alien, but Alien's throwing horror in there as well. Um, Terminator, Jesus, yep. and Terminator 2. Both are, mass- the abyss, oh, you just go down James Cameron's. Those are, but, but what you're talking about, a lot of those, or at least some of those, are, they're not primarily science fiction. In term, why? Because, yes, they have the science fiction overlay Mm -hmm. in terms of the world, in terms of set in the future, for example. But what you what you want to look at when you're trying to identify what is the primary genre that's being done here is what are the structure beats, what are the plot beats that they're tracking. Okay. So when you're talking about science fiction, and sometimes it's difficult to pull them apart. You can't see what a what the primary form is. But I, I, in science fiction, I talk about the matrix is primarily science fiction, but it's got a myth addition to it. Of course, you've got 2001. Um, Arrival, which is a female myth science fiction story. It's very holistic. It's not about battle. It's about preventing battles from happening. Very advanced, this film. Very advanced. I'm a huge fan of that. Um, um, so, and you've got things like Inception and Interstellar. These guys, these guys, uh, are the best, uh, in terms of film, understanding techniques of screenwriting. I'm not talking about necessarily the, would they make a great science fiction novel, but in terms of science fiction film, using the benefits, the strengths of the film medium, mm-hmm. there, there's nothing, there's, there's nobody better than these guys. Um, one of my favorite uh, as well, comedy. I- I'd love to hear what is a transcendent comedy. Oh. Well, first of all, comedy is really interesting because in a way you could argue that it is the opposite of every other form. Almost, almost every other form is about accomplishing a goal. Comedy is about failure of the goal. It's about every other genre is about how things work in some way. You know, we've got problems, but they're fixable and we're going to society is going to succeed. Well, comedy is about how things don't work, right? How things are screwed up and how the hero is incompetent and yet somehow succeeds at the end in spite of his incompetence. Um, to me, the I, I use a lot of TV examples because I believe that especially over the last 20 years since The Sopranos, but but really farther back to Seinfeld, um, TV has overcome film in terms of the best storytelling in the world. And, and I think it's even close. And so I use a lot of TV examples in, in a comedy. The bi- biggest example I used transcendent comedy is Seinfeld Seinfeld revolutionary. In my opinion, even greater than, than Sopranos, which I put number two is the greatest series ever made, but Seinfeld, the excellence, the level of excellence Per episode, per season, over nine seasons, there's nothing that matches that level of brilliance. Um, but it re- was revolutionary in terms of character. And it was revolutionary in terms of plot in comedy. Um, revolutionary in terms of character because you had four equal characters, not just the star, four equal characters. And you had, they were all unlikable in the classic sense of that term. That was unheard of. It was unheard of at the time. You did not do that, right? Not just one, four of them. And then it was revolutionary in plot because you were tracking four, typically four different storylines within a 22-minute episode. And they tracked for each one of those characters and then wove it together with a kick at the end in terms of how it all wove together. You never knew really how it was going to come together, but it always did. And it was always brilliant. Um, so in terms of comedy, I think you got to start with Seinfeld. I talk about a lot about Little Miss Sunshine. 
which is I just watched that the other day. Oh, so beautiful. Uh, Groundhog Day. It's Um, perfection. Perfection and the most philosophical comedy ever written by far, by far. And, and, and interesting, I talk a lot about Wedding Crashers in terms of Hmm. combining comedy genres, because you're there, you're again, why? Because you're getting the densification of plot. And a lot of times comedies don't have the densest plot. So what do you do? You combine comedy forms. In this particular case, they combined buddy picture with romantic comedy. Both of them are very popular. You put the two of them together and it's almost never done. You put the two of them together and you have this massive hit. In in something like, um, oh God, I just, I mean, you, well, Dumb and Dumber yeah. is, a, is a buddy film mixed with a quote unquote love story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But you start looking at the biggest hits of all time as far as comedies are concerned, and you can start seeing how they it's not a simple right straight line as far as like, oh, it's just a buffoon, you know, doing right. stuff. Right. It's it gets complex. But it the thing about comedies that when you said wedding crashers, I was like, Oh, that doesn't seem very complex. But with the second you said, Oh, those two genres, I'm like, oh, I guess it it's it's not on face surface, on right. the surface level. You really can't tell. That's what's about co- co- with other and genres. You can't. It's also the level. Harder. It's also the level of the quality of the writing. What I was talking about early on that a lot of writers know that you need to mix genres, but they don't know how because mixing is very difficult. Because you don't. What is the main line? What's the main desire line? Who's the hero? Who's driving the story? Who's the main opponent? What are the main beats that we're going to talk about? So on and so forth. So it's hard to do. So when you can mix genres in a seamless way so the audience can't see it, that's brilliance. That that's that is that is the level of craft that we're talking about. And that's why I wrote the book, which was to say, here's how you do it. Right. You know, you, these are all these great films that, that, that we love. Well, you know, what chance do I have to write something on that level? Well, it's technique. It goes down to technique and using the old things of three act structure and so on and so forth. That ain't going to get you anywhere close to that, to the technique that's required to, to write these kind of transcendent stories. You're talking about scripts and movies and novels and stories that are at the top 1%, if not 0.1% of all stories being told right now. You're literally laying things out that these are the top five or the top 10 screenplays Yep. Of every, every year at the Oscars. Like this is what this is the kind of storytelling we're talking about is to elevate yourself to that level yes. by understanding these genres and being able to combine them. Yeah. And I think that so many, so many young writers don't understand that the key, as we've been saying in this entire conversation, is com- combination of genres because that's what's interesting. Yeah. It, we're far beyond the straight hero. Yeah. You know, woman in distress, villain, hero, saves her from the train. We're way beyond that at this point. Well, you pointed it out earlier. The the viewer is so knowledgeable about story because he's seen thousands of them from the earliest age that, you know, I had talked about this in Detective. Detective story is a game that the author plays with the audience. Can I get you to the end of this thing before you figure out who did it? And it's gotten harder and harder because the audience is so savvy. They know what tells to look for in terms of, oh, that means that that person is probably not guilty. And that means they probably are guilty and so on. So you got to take it one step above that. And, And what I'm saying in this book is that is how all these genres work. The level of story that is required, story mastery that is required to succeed in any of these genres is so high. And what I'm, and you, you know me from things we've done in the past together, I'm all about being honest with writers in terms of this is what is required to be in that competition, to be at that level. You know, it, it's like it's like you want to play professional sports, you're talking about the top 0.1% <laughs> of athletes, right? You want to play at that level? This is what you got to do. This is the training you got to get. And so what I, and that's why this book is 700 pages because to, to break down each of these 14 genres to the degree required to write professionally in those genres, that was the kind of detail that was required. 
And unlike sports, uh, anyone can get in. If you have a typewriter and a, and a brain exactly. that understands this, you're not limited by genetics. <laughs> right, right. Because you yeah. and I are not going to the NFL no. or the NBA no. or the M- no. MLB no. or any of those places. Alex, I have always wanted to be the point guard for the for the Lakers. We, ain't I, I gonna, wanted to, ain't gonna I happen. wanted to I wanted to be a wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins. You know, yeah. it's it, like it just wasn't in our cards. Or we're doing right. God's work though. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with no, that. We're doing God's work. We're trying to tell better stories out there. Right. But that's something that it, it's it's kind of a reality bomb in truth that this is what you need to do to transcend, to really get to a higher level of storytelling if if this is the craft that you want to go down. Yeah. Look, we all aim to be that top 1%, but you have a better chance if you start understanding the technique a little bit more. And, you, and there's only so many times you can read a, a Tarantino script or a Shane Black script or an Aaron Sorkin script. It's kind of like reading a... In many ways, unless you really understand technique, it's like reading a a um, a physics equation. Exactly. And, exactly. and someone's telling you this this really is important. I'm like, I kind of understand what X is, but what is you Y? Like, oh, what you if you don't know what you're looking for, you read those scripts, and boy, that's really that was a really fun script. It was really great. You have no clue as to why. What is really structurally going on that produces those effects? That's why technique is so important. And, and I, you know, I talked to you, use that sports analogy again. You know, th- these guys, the, 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 the top athletes in their field, um, they, they weren't ju- they didn't just show up on the court being super talented from the beginning. Yeah, they probably had some real DNA, great natural ability in certain ways. However, they also have been getting training, coaching, deep training, probably from the age of six years old if you want to get to the professional level. So what I'm, what I try to do with this book, whereas, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just how do you write this genre? How do you write a great one? Because that's the, what's, what's going to be required to get set you above everybody else and get you into that 1%. You got to get professional level training, right? You got to know what to look for and you got to know the techniques for producing it yourself. Now, um, in the detective genre, things like Knives Out more recently. Yeah. That I feel did a really amazing job because I, when I watch television shows that are like, you know, let's say procedurals, uh, you know, cop shows, which are, you know, they're everywhere. I've gotten to the point where I could watch them and my wife and I are watching them and we'll sit there going, it's a janitor. No, it's not. And then as you, and you're right, it's that game. You're like, how far can I go till I figure it out? Yeah, and at a certain point, you're like, "Well, there's only one character left. It has to be that person." Um, mm-hmm. So it's just kind of like in TV, you kind of run out of time mm-hmm. to yeah. do that. But in a feature or in a show, let's say if it's a long show, you have more time to kind of throw a lot of red herrings out at at, at people. But in your opinion, what are some transcendent uh, detective stories? Obviously, you know, we'll go back to to, to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who yeah, I think it was Edgar Allan Poe who created the detective story. Yep. But Conan Doyle really took it to another place. Well, you know, I think Sherlock Holmes is still the greatest detective ever. And but but you're right. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe created the form and it hit and had many of the beats that are still the key beats in the form. I mean, this guy, Edgar Allan Poe, was was <laughs> so underrated in terms of his influence in the world of in the history of story. Um because he not only was probably the premier master of the horror form and what I call the psychological horror form, where you're getting that Stephen King thing with the psycho- psychological elements infusing the horror and making it even greater. He also created the detective form, two radically different forms, in certain ways, opposite forms. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, that's an incredible achievement. Um, Sherlock Holmes to this day is probably the most popular character in storytelling and in television. One of the main ways that you pitch a show is Sherlock Holmes doing X. You know, house was Sherlock Holmes was pitched Sherlock Holmes in a hospital, you know, right. um, and and uh, what was the mentalist was pitched as what would happen if Sherlock Holmes and Angelina, Angelina Jolie had a baby? I mean, it's just incredibly influential. But in terms of 
transcendent ones. I go back to vertigo, which mm. is, which is in, I, I think in many people in terms of film historians, um, it's in the top 10 of films ever made. But I break it down extensively in the book in terms of why is it a transcendent detective story? What are the key techniques that kick it kicked it up to that level and make it to this day that great? Um, more recently, I think Knives Out did a lot of unique flips to the form uh, that was very necessary now because detective story has almost completely left film and gone to television. Police right. procedure is an example. As you say, detective form is the most popular form in television worldwide, not just the U.S., worldwide. But it's for that reason, it's rarely seen in film. Um but you, you have to talk about Chinatown. Mm. My opinion, probably the most creative, uh, transcendent detective story of the last hundred years is Murder on the Orient Express. And I don't want to get into why that is, but some of the things that Agatha Christie, who is still in the top three in terms of detective writers, the things that she is doing there that, that thematically have so much more powerful than the, the normal detective story are just you, just phenomenal. So I have great respect for Murder on the Orient Express, um, and and so Chinatown, and and then in terms of I talk about transcendent detective story where we're talking about the mind. Um, the key film there is Rashomon. Oh, God, it's you're super, right. Super influential. But and but they also he also created a, a new genre of story. And of course, how I did that multiple times in his career. But with Rashomon, there's like the Rashomon movie. Like, yeah, it's the Rashomon effect. And now you can't do that without somebody saying, "Oh yeah, you're doing the Rashomon effect." Yeah, he he now owns that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was it's a, a story, one incident from three different perspectives, all in the same, and then you have to make the choice who's telling the truth. Right. Um, it, yeah, I mean, and it, not only that, but it's the beauty of how he shot it and all that stuff is, is crazy. Another genre, love, the love story. I love to hear your opinion on transcendent love well, stories. I could I could have picked all kinds of things here. Um, it, it's just such a, a beautiful form. The problem with love story is that so many people write it. You know, it, it is romance is the most popular genre in novels by far, by far. Um and romantic comedy, it's a it's a lovely combination of romance and comedy. Uh, it's extremely difficult to write well. And because it's been written so many times, again, you get that problem that you get with horror, which is if you're just doing the basic one, it's predictable. And you can't succeed with that. But recently, I think some ones that have really stood out are Silver Linings Playbook yeah. um, and 500 Days of Summer. Yep. A you know indie and kind of an indie thing, small level thing, but super creative in the script, super creative in how it is flipping a lot of the beats of love story. Um, I think you have to go back to when Harry met Sally. Oh, at, as masterpiece! Absolutely, yeah, it it's certainly in the top three of romantic comedies ever made. Um, and I go back to its predecessor, which is still in the top three, which is Philadelphia story. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. And then of course look there's, at, it, you look at, you look at Alex, you look at the, you look at that again. Now it's basically a stage play, but you look at it again and oh, you will see techniques that are still used predominantly in the form because what we have here is we have the female lead with three male suitors and it is the and where does that come from? It all comes from Jane Austen. Jane Austen is <laughs> mother of romantic comedy. She created the form. She is the master, and everybody else is using her techniques. But Philadelphia Story does them beautifully in the sense that the, the whole point of the love story is not just about the guy and the girl. It's about comparing comparing love. It's comparing marriages. It's comparing, in this case, the men, because you have three very different kind of men who will produce three very different kinds of marriages with her mm -hmm. and the way that they treat her and the way they look at her. 
And so it's just against it's like Mama, it's like Mama Mia. Philadelphia store is kind of like Mama Mia in that way. In 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 the, remind me how, how that works. Mama Mia was the three fathers. Oh, and we right, tra- right. they were trying to figure out who the father is and the right, suitors right. are, and and then they threw the daughter in, and there's Meryl Streep singing and Abba, right. and <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't necessarily think of Mama Mia with Philadelphia Story, agreed. Time, but you make a good point. You make yeah, ex- exactly. And then if, even going back farther in cinema is like it happened one night uh, yeah. with Clark Gable. Um, that was another one, and I mean you can't talk about romantic comedies, you know. You know, politically correct or not, Annie Hall is still a masterpiece. Oh yeah, I, I, I it mean, is. I don't, it is what you can separate the, the director. That movie is a masterpiece, and and it based the form of of modern day romantic comedies. Would you agree? Absolutely. I, I it is in the, unfortunately because of the 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 person, and I'm not making any judgment one way or the hey. other. We can't talk about him. But in terms of, but, but it cannot be denied that Annie Hall is one of the three greatest romantic comedies and majorly transcends the form. Major. <laughs> and then, and it was in nineteen eighty that came out. I think it was like seventy nine, seventy seven. Yeah, something like that. It was around that time. Can you imagine that time of? It's it's it transcends today. If that movie came out, it transcends. Yeah. Um, it's, it's such an influential film. There's two authors I want to just ask you about because I think both these authors transcend their genres in so many ways. And uh, the first one is Shakespeare and what he was able to do, not only in one genre, in multiple genres. Yeah. What is going on in his storytelling that connects so much with all of us? Because he was a playwright like many other playwrights of his day. But there's something about his storytelling. What is it about the themes of like, I mean, obviously Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, you know, is the ultimate love story tragedy. You know, you know, King Lear, Macbeth, Hamlet. I mean, Hamlet, the, arguably one of the most perfect stories ever written. These, what is he doing on a on a nuts and bolts level that makes us connect so much with his storytelling? Well, you know, it's such a crucial question. That's that's why I talk about it quite a bit in the book. Um, And we talk about it both in the tragedies and in the comedies. And his his skill is equal in both of those areas. I think most people would say his tragedies are are at the highest level, but that may be because of the bias towards serious storytelling as opposed to comedy. And I'm not sure that that's justified. But having said that, you know, when I in, in my story class, I've always talked about him as, you know, we all consider him the greatest writer of all time. And one reason for that is that of every level of story, of every level of technique, whether it be plot, character, theme, et cetera, et cetera, he is the best at that level. Dialogue, he is the best at that level. So, so it, you know, we could go on forever in terms of what he's doing. In the book I talk about, in the tragedies, I talk about one of the tricks that he uses is that he matches the story with the psychological flaw of the character at that age. What do so, you mean? So in, in the romantic tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, it, if the tragedy evolves from the flaws of these two young people. They're very young. I, th- I think they're 14 or something in the in the play. Um, I could be wrong, but they're very young. But but it this is from the the tragedy evolves from the overwhelming passion of first love and the inability of these young people to understand how they can put not only deal with their their families, but how they can more importantly deal with their own passion, and that's where the true that's where the true tragedy lies. Um, you then go to Hamlet. Hamlet's a young adult, and so the great flaw for Hamlet is he is trying to make moral sense of the world, and his flaw is not that you know he's not normally talked about as well. Um, he, he didn't know how to make a decision. He didn't know how to act. Well, no, his flaw is he is so conscious of the moral conundrum that he is dealing with 
and whether the right and wrong of what his response is going to be, that it leads to the tragedy that ultimately kills him. And this is the flaw of a young person, a young adult, who is still formulating their moral code. Then you get up to a Macbeth. Macbeth is middle-aged. And what is the key flaw there? It's when you're in middle age, it's all about ambition. You know, it's, 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 it's how far do you go to get the, the life success that you're looking for? And then we jump way up to Lear. That is the flaw of an old man. That is a flaw of somebody who does not, cannot recognize when his power is over and he cannot recognize which daughter really loves him. Right. And so he, again, these are all characters who create their own demise. Now in the comedy chapter, I talk about Shakespearean comedies and all of the techniques that, that he uses, the major structure techniques that he uses to get his comic effects. One of the most important, which he also used in Romeo and Juliet is mistaken identity. And this is a major, this is a major technique in all comedy is mistaken identity. Um, or, and, and playing, taking on a role, taking on a disguise because comedy is all about facades. It's all about people put on facades to be successful in work or in love. And then the story tracks how we pull those facades down. And so, and so, you know, mistaken identity and, 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 uh, Role playing is one of the ways people put on facades, but because it's done in a comic vein, we get to laugh at it. Whereas in when when there's mistaken identity in Romeo and Juliet, it creates the tragedy. Yeah, something like Much Ado About Nothing or Midsummer Night's Dream. I, mean, yeah. I think if Much Ado About Nothing, there is a mistaken identity that kind of spawns the whole. Yeah, it spins the story to start. I mean, and it just keeps going and going and going, even though it's planned, you know, false identity and things right. like that. But that, yeah. that is the brilliance of that film. Uh, oh, excuse me, of that story. Um, another one I wanted to talk about author wise and and it's and I ask about these authors because it's so important because these are at the top level <laughs> of these are the all stars of writing. And it's really interesting to to deconstruct why they're successful. J.K. Rowling in the Harry Potter series, you know, on the surface, it's about a wizard going to a school, some spec, there's definitely spectacle in there. We've all heard of wizard stories before and, and magic stories, but there was something that connected with the worldwide audience that sent kids standing in line at a bookstore for a book. Can you imagine? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is it about? That, that those eight books, there's seven books, excuse me, those yeah. seven books that just connected with us at such a, a deep, deep level. Well, again, there's a ton of reasons, but I believe you have to start with how she mixed genres. That, okay. is, that is a definitely somebody who is pre, pre before the writing process spent major time figuring out how am I going to combine genres here? And what did she do? She took fantasy. She took coming of age. Yeah. She took elements of horror. And she used a subgenre that is very much in British storytelling, which is the public school story, meaning private school. Uh, Oliver, uh, yeah, boarding, yeah. boarding school, basically. Boarding school. Mm -hmm. And the combination of basically coming up with a boarding school for wizards um, is just is just when you think about it, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Because it's just so brilliant. Mm -hmm. But then you get the elements of the, and I talk about it in the coming of age chapter because you get because it's such a unique coming of age story because you're tracking every year in this kid's coming of age. You're breaking it down literally. into literally. Literally seven years of his coming of age from 11 to whatever, 17. And so you've got, you, you, you're you tracking that, which makes it very personal. Those, those are drama elements again. You're tracking that coming of age within a school environment, which is a school that everybody would have loved to go to, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you're doing it with all of the great fantastic stuff that comes with the fantasy form. 
Um, you know, and you, I mean, but the amount of inventiveness that, you know, with, including the sport that they play, Quidditch, Quidditch you know, Quidditch, this, yeah. you invent an entire sport that she's going to have these people play. Um, you know, the, the, the mogul, mogul, muggles, muggles. Yeah. Muggles. Yeah. The, 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 the different characters in, you know, the, the fantasy character web is among the greatest ever done. Um, the, you know, the, the use in terms of plot of uh, this is something I talk about in my story class a lot, which is the, the use of the, in of what I call in between characters, flip characters, which are characters that, appear to be an ally, but are really an opponent, or they appear to be an opponent and they're really an ally. She does that with, with just even one character, Snape, that track, oh. attracts the plot for seven books. And you really don't know. You don't. Until the end, is he, yeah. is he for me or is he against me? Because sometimes he's for me, sometimes he's against me. Exactly. And it keeps you like, you know, like, and then people who you who are like, oh, this professor, he must be, he's so nice, he must be. And then it's Voldemort in disguise. Like, <laughs> right. And, and and that's what I was saying about earlier in terms of this is a level of plot excellence that she has that when you combine it with the right mix of genres, and again, these are genres that have never been mixed before, you combine that with an uh, amazing cast of characters, you combine that with the technique of the three musketeers with mm -hmm. the three lead characters, but one of yep. the most popular, again, we go back to to do ma the, the the height of plot in the history of story i mean it's just just so many things that she's bringing to the table not to mention one of the best story worlds ever created which is story world is one of the most important trends in the last 20 years in worldwide storytelling in every medium i mean it just goes on and on with with what she's done there and and that is why it is the most popular series of books ever written it is it is remarkable what she was able to do with that that book series, and and we'll be talking about. I mean, they'll be talking about Harry Potter in two hundred years, three hundred years. It, it will be it'll be just they'll just keep talking about it forever and ever because it's just done so well. And so, like when I first read the first book, I felt like, and I hadn't read a book at that age for a while, and I was like, it was I called it literary crack because yeah. you just <laughs> you just couldn't put it down and it was so and that's why I just wanted to kind of deconstruct what she was doing there because if we can even get a little bit of that magic on our stuff yeah. it is a man it, it it definitely elevates you to another level and the last the last big author of, of our time is Stephen King yeah who is a master of of horror yeah. um obviously we I mean I'm not saying anything that nobody knows but and there's so many different stories and so many different things, but like just taking two stories like Carrie, which was his first book and it, you know, the psychological things going on there and the themes that he touches on, what, how can you, can you kind of deconstruct what he does again and again and again and again? And he does it so fast. And he, how many books has he written? A hundred? Yeah. I, I I don't know the, the guy is incredibly pro prolific and yet incredibly good. Um, really, for me to understand Stephen King, you have to go back to Poe, and what Poe was really crucial for is he was really the first, and in certain ways the greatest. Obviously, not nearly as prolific as Stephen King, but still maybe the greatest in terms of taking horror with all its very symbolic elements, very mythical elements, and grounding it in the psychological, in the personal, in the real. And th this is, you know, like the telltale heart, uh, oh. the fall the house of Usher, um, uh, the pit and the pendulum, these, these kind of things, you're getting all the power of the horror form with making it so personal that the reader can get the terror of it because that's really what we're talking about horror or terror that is it is it is a genre that is about one emotion terror right how do i get that how do i get that out of the reader or the viewer and so what i think king did was he brought that to the to to the modern day um because you you look at the the great stories that he's done they're very personal they're very they, most of them are 
they're within a family. Uh, there is a person with a tremendous psychological flaw that it's it's not some weird otherworldly thing. It's very personal that we all can see. You know, um, Carrie is an example. Pet Cemetery is an example. But he he then takes the the foundation of the of the real individual within a family, and then creates he spell he spins out a greater and greater horror coming from the internal flaw of that person. And that, again, is where you're combining that. That's how you transcend in every, in every one of these genres. You get the power of the type, the power of the genre, and genre means type. It's a type of story. And then you combine these highly personal dramatic elements. And that, that combination, I've said this in my story class forever, that is this in terms of a single strategy, there is no greater strategy in terms of having both a popular and a critical success than those than combining those two elements. And King within the horror form does it better than anybody's ever done. Now to start wrapping up this, because we could keep talking about this for days. Right. Um, even if we just sat here and read your book, it would be days. Uh yeah. <laughs> Um, I wanted, I think one of the main reasons you decided to put this book together was the art, the, 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 the business of selling yes. genre, buying and selling genre in whatever form you're using, whether that be novel, whether that be screenplay, whether that be video game, whether it be anything. Can we talk a little bit about the business of buying and selling genres so people really understand sure. what the marketplace is looking for? Sure. The, as I mentioned, where this really happened, the, there, there's before Star Wars and there's after Star Wars. Um, before Star Wars, and I talk about in the, the introductory chapter of the book, um, the I believe it was the year before, two years before Star Wars, Jaws came out. Jaws was a massive worldwide hit. Single genre story. Done Very, really well. Yeah. Really well. Okay. Two years later, you have Star Wars. And everybody turned down that script. Everybody. Yeah, everyone literally everybody turned down. down. It, it, this basically, what, what this is, uh, who, who, is it, who is the, what was the old TV show, sci-fi TV show? Oh, Buck uh, Rogers. Buck, Buck Rogers, Rogers, right? I said, come on, man. Nobody's going to come to see this. This is ridiculous. Sci-fi. Nobody wants right. to watch no, sci-fi. No, no, of course. And and there was a reason for it because sci-fi films of the 50s, because they didn't have the special effects, there are a lot of times they just look ridiculous. You they know, do. So they, so they it had this unintentional com comedic effect, but the but what was what, the, what they were not seeing was what that was in the script it was in the script, in that he was combining all these genres in a seamless way, and that had worldwide effect because no matter the culture, I love that story and I love how plot dense it is, and so. What I what I always tell you know up and up through probably the eighties, the perception was in Hollywood that Hollywood buys and sells movie stars. Um, after Star Wars and definitely into the nineties and beyond, especially when you had th massive success like Pixar, there no movie stars there. Yeah, you hear some voices, but they're not successful because of movie stars. Had nothing to do with movie stars. It's story star. You're selling the story. That's why it's also, so it's not a movie star world in Hollywood anymore. It's not, certainly not directors. We like to think we know the names of these directors. So what? It has nothing to do with that. It's, and, and it's certainly not buying and selling writers because we're screenwriters are still a low person on the totem pole, right? <laughs> so what is it? They're selling great story. And what that means is, and what has come to, to me, especially over the last 20 years, is dense plot. And what is the key to that? It's genres, because genres are plot forms that have been tested over centuries, centuries. They've gotten rid of all the dross. They've gotten rid of all the, the, the wasted time. It's pure story. And especially in a screenplay, as you know, it's all about the bones. It's pure story beat. There's no time for any padding there. And so what genres do is they give you this vehicle for telling a really well-plotted story and at the same time hooking in a really powerful thing that also has already been worked out. 
That's what Hollywood, that's what the Hollywood money people are looking for. And you don't think they know that? You better believe they know that. They know because they've heard all the stories about Star Wars and reading Joseph Campbell and so on and so forth. They know that, which is why the most popular story form genre, as I mentioned, is to this day myth. Um, because it has worldwide appeal. So typically, at least with all these superhero movies, what are you getting? You're getting yes. a myth story plus action, maybe love, but but not even there, not really. But you're getting myth plus action. Um, and you're getting a savior story, which is a subform of myth. Um, so the, the the money guys know that. They know that what we're buying, we're in the business of buying and selling genres. And so you need to bring us one, a story that is one, hits the genre beats, two, does them in a way we've never seen before, because if you can surprise us, you can surprise them. So is that why Marvel has basically taken over the box office? Because if you, t- you pull out Marvel and Top Gun 2022 uh, yeah. is not a great year in the box office. Um, there's just not enough product going out to the theatrical experience. So w- is that why Marvel has just taken over i mean they literally have taken over hollywood i mean it's either a marvel movie or i mean obviously a big ip but marvel is one of those arguably the biggest ip in yeah. cinema today um is that why they're so successful because i mean comic books have been around superheroes have been around since the 30s you know or since i think since the 30s but hollywood basically. didn't know the power of comic books could have in terms of cinematic appeal, right? Because they were comic books. But right. as soon as Star Wars came out, you essentially had a comic book story form with comic book characters, but done mm-hmm. really, really well. And Stan Lee, what was the what is the trick to Marvel? Is that Marvel took the myth form with the superhero character and brought in drama elements. What do I mean by that? I mean they had main characters with flaws. And the real distinction here that you have to understand, it wasn't a Marvel, but this is where the lesson is clearest, is the difference between Superman and Batman. Superman was the first superhero, right? But he's perfect. The only flaw he has is a physical flaw. It's kryptonite, right? But basically, and of course, it's also based on one of the, the the greatest mistaken identity jokes in the history of story, which is, you know, he puts on a pair of glasses and we can't tell who he what? is. What? Where did yeah. Superman yeah. go? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but the point is, Superman, we love to see his success and he does all these great things and he flies and blah, blah, blah. But by far the greater character and the greater story form is Batman. Why? Because he has massive internal flaws. And all the story plays off of that. And all of the problems with justice play off of how far do you go to get justice before it becomes revenge and then beca- and then you have a moral decline. And so Marvel, if you look at all their characters, they're all like Hulk and so on. They all have these internal flaws, which in the old days, as early as the 70s, or as far ago as the 70s. 60s, yeah. In the 60s and 70s, the the conventional wisdom in Hollywood was you want a superhero with no flaws because then they're not unlikable and therefore it'll cut into box office. And then all of a sudden, Marvel comes along and shows us, and there were other examples of this, but Marvel is probably the best example of it, shows us that just the opposite is the case, that when you have a superhero with real flaws, we we can um, feel this guy. We can understand what they're going through, and it's not just a sequence of stunts where they fly around and you know knock somebody across ten buildings and so on and so forth. So, so this is this is why, and Marvel is able to do it not just for one superhero character. They've been able to create an entire universe of characters that interplay. The story weave on their films is amazing. I would love, it's just very similar to a TV writing room yep. in terms of how they're doing this. And and what you, what you the complexity of, of how these characters are gonna interplay with and interact with each other is incredible. But that's how they, 
they take films that basically hit the same story beats all the time and still have that kind of success. Well, I mean, it's going back to Greek mythology. I mean, the gods, literally the gods all had flaws, the human flaws to make them accessible. Because if it was just Zeus and Venus and everyone was perfect, then we was like, who cares? Yeah. What's interesting is that they have flaws and they, they, they in, in the storytelling, whoever came up with these stories of Greek mythology or at the time, the religion of <laughs> of, of Zeus and, and all of that was that they added human elements to it and watching them, you know, sleep around and do this right. thing. And there was anger. That's what made those 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 characters, if you're looking at it, a story point of view, so interesting to watch. And, uh, and that's why that's why I tell you about in the book that that Marvel and superhero movies in general are the modern religion. They are doing exactly the same thing that the Greek gods did 2,500 years ago. So they there is action. There are a collection of heroes, superheroes with superhero abilities with, that also have human, all too human flaws. And that combination who then go around and s save the world. It's as I say, it's it's a sub form of myth and religion, which is the savior story. And it's so powerful that there is a, a, a universe or a, a timeline where, let's say, we wipe ourselves out and only a handful of primitive people are around and they find the stories of Superman and Spider-Man. They, they become gods. And this, 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 this mythology would easily become, or Star Wars, the myth of, of the Jedi. That's yep. many people consider that a religion because exactly. he gets all the beats. It does. It is a religious story. And one of the things I contend in the book is that if you can do, if you can get theme to that level, because theme at the highest level is essentially your religion that you're expressing to the audience. It's a collection of stories oh. for how to live. And so if you can get your theme to that level without appearing to be religious, there's nothing more powerful than that. You have hit the jackpot. And that's what all of these stories that we've been talking about have hit in one way, shape, or form. I mean, The Matrix and Shawshank and... Uh, the storyteller is telling you their perspective on yes. how to live life. And it, well, it's George Lucas said it very easily uh, back in the day. He said, stories are the meats and potatoes of our society. That's how we, that's mm -hmm. how we transfer over the moral code that yep. we live, we live by. That's right. And that's why he wanted to create something like star Wars mm -hmm. that passed along this insanely powerful moral code and he wasn't hidden about that, by the way. It was hidden in, with all the flashiness and the spectacle. Yes. Right. But it's pretty clear. Yeah. I mean, the Jedi. The, the Sith. Jedi is a religion. It may not be a very defined one, but it is very definitely a religion. It's It, it, it leans more toward an Eastern religion than, say, a Western oh, religion. No question. But, but the point is, that is that that combination of mixed genres execution of the story beats and the fact that it's thematically a powerful religion you know may the force be with you who the hell in this world doesn't know that line so the point is that combination is unbeatable and george lucas showed the world how that would be in his defined storytelling from then on john when is this insane book going to come out so people can buy this book start reading it uh, and uh, and spend a good part of their life reading it because it's 710 pages. But where can they find? Uh, when is this book coming out? When is going to be available to the public? The best way the best way to get it is to go to this website, anatomyofgenres.com, and I'll have links to Amazon and it has links to all of the bookstores wherever you want it. Um, the book comes is officially out on the 29th of November. But if you would like to get your pre-order in, again, go to that site, anatomyofgenres.com, and you can make your order now, and they'll send it to you as soon as it's available. And, what, and where can people find out more about you, your other book, Anatomy of Story, and the courses you teach and seminars and all the stuff that you do? That's at truby.com, T-R-U-B-Y.com. And it has all the information you need. John, it has been an 
absolute pleasure uh, talking to you. I mean, seriously, we're going to, I, I want to have a, like some spinoff episodes where we just sit down and break down Shawshank, Matrix, Fight Club. I'm just all my favorite movies. We're yeah. just going to sit down <laughs> and I break them you. down to see what makes these things tick so beautifully. But uh, I appreciate you, man, so much for everything you're doing for storytellers around the world. But I think in, in, in many ways in this conversation, it, it, I think the conversation transcended a bit in the sense that this is more about not not as much only about not only about story, but about the self and about our journey through life and the power these stories have to help us along that path and the responsibilities of storytellers that we have. And you've given us a great toolbox to go into to really understand how to do that at a very high level. So, John, my friend, thank you so much for coming back on the show. And we will do that other episode one day soon. Alex, it's always a blast talking with you. You're the best in the business. Um, I will talk with you about any film you want, anytime you want. Uh, there's nothing more fun for me to do. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.